Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here to uh, the 2020 Ag Lenders Conference. My name is Brian Brayman. I'm a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. Uh, and I'm also the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center. Uh, and this is a conference that I always look forward to and I'm thrilled uh, that we're here in person. Uh, so if, um, you know, for the folks here in the uh, room, if you have questions, comments, rebuttals, whatever, shoot up your hand or uh, speak up. I'm happy to engage with you all in uh, discussion. Uh, and then also too, for the folks online, I know Rich is following uh, the chat. So if you all have questions uh, too, we, um, I'm happy to uh, slow down and address it. So um, I do have a set of PowerPoint slides, handouts uh, for you all to kind of follow along with. So if you want to have those, I know Rich prepared those for you folks here in person, and I think everyone else online has access to them. Um, but we're going to go through this and have a discussion on the macro uh, update. Um, I'm try make sure I, I have time for questions uh, throughout, especially at the end. Um, certainly don't have a, a lot of answers. I have a few takeaways uh, from what's going on in the macro environment and how it affects us in rural America and agriculture. So uh, I'm going to go on over this a little bit. Um, so where I, I always start off when looking at uh, the macro economy is let's first of all start off with the key measure for any uh, economy is how you are, uh, the value of the goods that you produce and services that you provide. And certainly we all have heard about the significant decline the US economy took uh, through the pandemic. When we shut down an economy, an economy that is built off of consumption, roughly about two thirds of our total GDP comes from consumption, almost 70% actually, uh, it really hurts, right? And that's why you see a graph like you see here. We had an annualized decline in quarter two of this year of nearly 32%, unprecedented, just significant drop. And in fact, we are in a recession because quarter one of this year, we did have a decline in GDP. So two consecutive quarters officially is a recession. Um, I will say this every year that I go out here and I present at Ag Lenders Conference and I do the macro update, Everybody asks me, Brian, when are we going to go into a recession? And I said, answered last year, I said, probably within two years. So I'm going to take this as a win. An economist predicted this, right? I didn't predict the <laughs> pandemic, but I did predict a recession. I got it within my time frame, right? Well, I truly wish I was actually wrong, but, but we did have uh, this decline. Now, looking forward, one of the things that's kind of interesting as we get more information and more data uh, is looking at forecasts. And before this foreca uh, forecasted rebound uh, in quarter three was not actually as strong as what is shown here. So roughly about a snapback of about 25% is what at least through the Wall Street Journal forecast is expecting. Uh, before it was expected to maybe be a bit slower, more around um, that 18, 15 mark. So that's some good news. You know, there maybe our economy is starting to come back. Uh, there's some confidence coming back that we're beginning to see uh, that improvement. And then looking out, you know, coming back down and looking at roughly, you know, about four and a half percent through the end of the year and then settling back down to three percent, um, which is but for growth for our economy, looking back over uh, previous quarters where we had uh, expansion, a three percent growth is actually above where we were in the past. So maybe hopefully we can continue uh, that trend and these forecasts come to fruition. But the thing that really a lot of these forecasts and growth and improvement within the US economy hinges on uh, is a vaccine. Um, here, the Goldman Sachs, they put out a nice report. And I think it's something that's worth, worth sharing and thinking about this recovery. And in their baseline recovery, they're assuming that a vaccine, a widespread vaccine for COVID uh, is available and ready for the uh, public in quarter one of 2021. And that's where you would see us recovering back to our previous real GDP levels somewhere around the end of quarter, uh, beginning of quarter two, right around quarter two, returning back to where we were before the uh, pandemic. And then as you, at least what Goldman Sachs is predicting, as that vaccine gets pushed out further and further, you see these lines begin to fall, right? 
And if we have no vaccine, they're not predicting us through 2021 to get back to uh, pre-pandemic uh, GDP levels. Um, and what's interesting, there was a lot of discussion about, well, how is this recovery going to look? Some of you all might have read, or, you know, read about the letters of economic recoveries, the L, the V, the W, what's it going to be? Well, a lot of folks are settling on this swoosh, so a little bit different, and it's really driven largely by whether or not we have a vaccine. And I think a lot of that goes to just building consumer confidence. Whenever you talk about the macroeconomy for the United States, you have to talk about the consumer, again, because it's one of the most important components of GDP. So the vaccine is certainly going to have a say as we come out of uh, this pandemic induced uh, recession. So before you look at any sort of consumption measures, uh, we need to understand the labor market. Uh, the labor market is what really drives a lot of that for GDP. And when we shut down and we sent people to the unemployment lines, uh, that had a real significant uh, shock to our labor market. In fact, unemployment rate, as you see on the graph on the left, shot up to nearly 15% well above any other previous uh, recessionary periods where you see that that unemployment rate tends to lag, right? As we go into recession, unemployment rate will go up. We're well above any of those uh, previous uh, numbers, but the labor market has begun to improve, right? When we first went into that, we saw millions, I think the first week of initial unemployment claims was right at 2.8 million unprecedented levels where folks were going to the unemployment line uh, that contributed to the 15.4 percent unemployment rate and then eventually turned into continued claims continued unemployment claims which is what you see on the graph on the right right there's a little bit of lag as you you know they continue to go and have those file for those claims and then that shot up to significantly high levels but that has begun to come down right as the labor market has begun to heal, the unemployment rate today, you can't really see it in the graph, you barely can see that line come down, but it has fallen to 8.4% today. And a lot of that is folks are beginning to go back to work. But there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of discussion in Washington, D.C. about whether or not we need additional fiscal stimulus in order to ensure that this labor market is healthy and can continue to stay healthy. And that very well might be. But my question that I always ask is like, well, how are you targeting that fiscal stimulus? Where is that aid going? Because a lot of the folks that I work with in the, in the cooperative space and then talking with other uh, agribusinesses, if we have uh, funds that are aimed and targeted to that unemployment, why would they you know, uh, stop collecting unemployment when they, you know, and go to work? If they can continue to have an elevated unemployment wage, that is you know, sending a market signal to our labor force that might put a headwind on labor market improvements. So how do we send aid in a way that makes sure that we're building up the businesses, right? That businesses can continue to function and offer those competitive wages that are out there. So you see where that continued claims is maybe starting to level off. Um, could it rise again? if we have a misguided uh, fiscal stimulus. I mean, it's possible, right? That is certainly something that could happen. But hopefully, if this fiscal aid does come into the marketplace, it's there to support businesses so that they can continue to operate. I think the Paycheck Protection Program, you know, there are some faults within it, but it certainly had that kind of aim. How do we make sure to provide value back to those businesses? The other, I didn't put um, a, a, a consumption graph or looking at you know personal consumption expenditures. Rather, um, I, maybe some of you all have followed this before. Uh, a, a friend of mine, his name is David Widmar with Agricultural Economic Insights. This is one of his favorite consumption graphs that he likes to look at right now as something that is real time, is updated very regularly and has a rich history of looking back. And that is looking at um, gasoline supply to the market. Um, so uh, it, I would encourage you all, for Agricultural Economic Insights, great follow. They got a blog post, have updates and stuff. So go feel free to take a look at that. But 
when we look at this graph, what it shows is the four week average of products of gasoline supply to the market. And in a way, this is an implied measure of consumption, right? It's not a direct measure of consumption, but it's implied, right? Because we're supplying gasoline to the market, generally it's consumed uh, fairly quickly. So it's an implied measure. So if we look at that, you can see that steep drop, right? The pandemic, we shut down. And again, if we're not out driving, doing things, even, especially here in, you know, like say Kansas, but even in other parts of the US where it's more densely populated, we need to, we need to see that gasoline consumption going up because it's an indication of people driving around, conducting business, purchasing things. But that steep drop, now it's starting to rebound um, and where we're at, if you were, I believe I have a, a line drawn across, and if you were to just, you know, take this line and draw it back to where we're at at the peak uh, coming out of this uh, pandemic shutdown, we're basically at the, the 2008 recession levels. Um, so we've come back to that. And then if you go back a little bit further, we're at gasoline consumption right around 2000. So we're definitely nowhere from a gasoline consumption perspective where we were uh, pre-pandemic. And also too, if you think about the price of gasoline right now, it's quite a bit lower too. So there's still, we're seeing the effects of social distancing, um, slowing down of the economy. Again, kind of pointing towards the need uh, for that vaccine in order to really build up consumer confidence. But looking at this four week rolling average, you kind of have an idea of some economic activity how things are improving. So it has improved, it's just not back to those pre-pandemic levels. So uh, on fiscal aid, you know, we uh, certainly have had the US government has provided a number of programs. I don't have all of the different ad hoc uh, programs that have been put up here, especially for agriculture, but we all know that they're quite sizable. You know, the CARES Act, uh, you know, was certainly quite large, nearly $2 trillion. Um, but just looking at total U.S. public debt, you know, as a share of U.S. GDP, uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is estimating that uh, FY21, we are going to eclipse 100%. So total U.S. debt divided by our GDP will actually be above that 100% mark. The only other time that we were above that was back during World War II, when we were financing the wartime effort. So the way that I think about it, we are financing the war against the virus, right? So, but that comes with some concerns. You know, what's the plan to go out? This certainly wasn't sustainable following World War II. You know, we saw that come off. How long will this continue to go? And I will address this later. A lot of folks, when you see this very high public debt number, begin to be concerned about future inflation. What does that inflation outlook look like, right? How is that going to transpire? What, how might that develop? And I have some thoughts that I'll share with you all here in a bit. The other side, so we have the fiscal side uh, with the U.S. government. We also have monetary policy. Um, monetary policy is something that I'm uh, familiar with. I used to work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Uh, it's something, you know, to maybe see it a little bit differently uh, and hopefully can add some thoughts uh, to it. You know, we have a number of different programs, probably the, you know, the one we're most familiar with because it happened during the 2008 recession was dropping the Fed funds rate down to zero. Uh, we are certainly here at the zero bound right now. And by what the Fed has said publicly, that is going to stay for quite some time, 2023, maybe even beyond. And I will say this, when I worked at the Fed, that was one thing that they took very seriously. What they say in public, they're going to do it. There would have to be something very uh, unique and very strange to make them reverse course because the market really listens to them. They build that into their expectations. So for the Fed, when I read that announcement coming out, 2023 or you know even beyond longer term, lower Fed funds rate, take that to heart. That's going to be there for a while. That would be my, my opinion, my uh, forecast. Certainly we have expanding the balance sheet. We'll go through that here in a little bit, looking at quantitative easing, uh, purchasing different securities, treasuries, uh, providing financing to lending institutions. Uh, and then there are a lot of other interesting things that the Fed has taken 
um, you know, unprecedented me measures to be a direct lender. Two facilities aimed mostly at corporate debt markets have been widely used, really have been, you know, fairly successful in implementation, right? Providing that debt lending. One program that hasn't had as much success is the Main Street facility. So lending directly to small and medium sized businesses. Um, so for you all in this room who are lenders, this would be a program that was designed for you to provide credit. Well, it hasn't really had much traction at all, primarily because if you've looked at the terms of it, they're, they're pretty strict. It's really more aimed uh, to those credits, to those loans that might not be uh, as credit worthy. Uh, and then maybe we would want to unload it, maybe. So it, it just, it, if they decide to adjust those terms, um, then possibly that facility might be used more. But at this time, it's just really not seeing uh, a lot of traction. And this for me, just thinking about when a government's central bank is a primary lender in the marketplace, you know, in some ways they're picking winners and losers, right? Are they picking the right ones? Are they making the right loans? A, a lot of questions come up about, you know, what, what is the implication of this six trillion corporate debt market that's out there? How does that develop going forward? Right? And if we look at the Fed's balance sheet, so this shows their assets, um, looking at it for, through time, uh, two things really just strike uh, me. Uh, the first is just the size of it, right? Before the Great Recession uh, in 2008, the Fed operated with about $150 billion of assets. And I think it's important to note that the Fed, there's no taxpayer dollars that go into finance the Fed. The Fed is a, a for-profit industry, institution, if you want to think about it like this, it's a for-profit institution for the U.S. Treasury because any additional amount of profit that they have left over after financing their own operations goes right back into the U.S. Treasury, right? So before the Great Recession, they needed about $850 billion, right? They had traditional security holdings, typically U.S. government debt, the blue area, and then maybe some green area lending to financial institutions. But the Great Recession hit, we got up over $2 trillion. It wasn't working. We started buying mortgage-backed securities. We got up to four trillion. Then it started to unwind. You can see it going down. And now we're at over seven trillion for the U.S. or for the Federal Reserve's uh, assets that they hold. So let, I'm sorry. I'm a farm kid from Iuka, Kansas. So a trillion dollars is hard for me to really wrap my head around. So I'm going to go through a little exercise with you. By the way, this is not the Fed approved portion of my presentation. Uh, if I was a Fed economist, could do this, but an academic, I'm going to. All right, so let's go through a little thought exercise. What does a trillion dollars look like? Well, okay, so scale size, this is a hundred bucks, right? Easily fits in your pocket. And in fact, if we do a stack of them, $10,000, a lot of money, still can fit in your pocket. You could walk around, nobody would really even know that you have 10 grand on you. Now we get into a million dollars, and I'm going to put a person here off to the side for a little bit of scale. You know, it's a nice little bundle of money, but that could be in your backpack, right? And never even noticed you had it, right? It's a million bucks. Now we're getting into some serious quantity, a hundred million dollars, right? You got to have a forklift to move this thing around. And then we put in a billion. That's a billion dollars, but it's still, you know, relative to the person sitting over here, it's just, you know, it's not a lot. This is a trillion. Notice that the pallets now are double stacked. They go about, you know, roughly 40 or so deep, 40 or so wide. And then we have uh, the person over here off the side. That's a lot of money, right? A lot of funds. And the Fed's got seven of these sitting on their assets, right? Huge amount of money, tremendous amount. That being above seven trillion, it's mind boggling to think about. Now, people always point to, is this inflationary, right? Right, the definition of rapid inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. $7 trillion is too much money, right? That's a lot of money, <laughs> right, seven. Too much money. The thing though that you must remember, these assets cannot enter into our normal lending 
uh, banking, commercial banking system. The Fed controls it. If they were to enter into the marketplace as loanable funds, that's when we would have the chasing piece. And it would be very, very difficult. I don't have this in here um, to show, but when you look at velocity measures that have the monetary base included in it, this is figured into the monetary base and you look at those velocity numbers and they've plummeted, right? But it's kind of artificially been pushed down, largely because a lot of those assets, those funds that are out there cannot enter into the normal commercial banking lending world. Okay, so when you think about future inflation, don't think about what the Fed is doing on quantitative easing. What I would think about is the composition, the second piece that comes out of this graph. So we got a, a lot of it, but what's the composition of it? What is the Fed buying? Well, the first is this, we'll go through this red area, right? These are mortgage-backed securities. This was back when uh, Bernanke, we, we were going through the Great Recession. Things were not going along very well. And Bernanke famously came out and said, we need to fix one of the pistons in the US economic engine because it was misfiring. It wasn't working. And what was it? It's mortgage-backed securities. That was when the Fed came in and started buying mortgage banks. And in fact, in 2009, they were really the only game in town, really about the only ones who were buying it. Why is that? Why was that? Why did I, in a little hint, why, did, why do I shade this red? I do pick red for a reason. What did we used to call those assets back then? It, didn't have, it had a you know pretty negative connotation to a pretty negative name. Do you guys remember? You didn't know, you come to a live event, all of a sudden you forgot how to talk. How to come <laughs> enter, enter. What, what, what do we call them? The Sutton assets. I think I heard it. Toxic, right? Remember toxic assets? These were assets that were uh, nobody really wanted. They were being unloaded onto the Fed's balance sheet, right? So they were purchasing that. So the Fed was picking a winner. Now, that was the winner because they felt that they needed to fix that part of the U.S. economy. So they were propping it up and supporting it. Um, so for me right now, with additional amounts of mortgage backs or rebind, I, I kind of like it. I just, I'm going through a refinance on my home and all right, <laughs> looks pretty good. The other piece to look at is the orange area. So the orange area represents U.S. government debt. And when we look at that and you have, uh, by definition, this is called monetizing the debt. So any country's central bank that purchases its own government's debt is called monetizing the debt. And history has proven to us that stokes inflation. When a central bank purchases its own a government's debt, that is monetizing the debt and it will spark inflation. And that's what the Fed is trying to do. When we are going through these very disruptive periods, they're trying to ward off potential deflation and trying to create inflation, right? Now, that's not long run sustainable. So how does the Fed unwind this? We had a little bit of a preview of what they were doing right here. Uh, back in about 2016, 2017, they started to let the securities naturally unwind. And if you look here where it was flat for so many years, all the Fed was doing was we have these existing securities. When they mature, we are just going to reinvest it back into a similar security. So that kept it flat. But the economy, they felt, was going pretty well. Interest rates were starting to tick up. They allowed the, the balance sheet to begin to unwind. And that's the least disruptive way to go about it, right? And the Fed doesn't want to create disruption. So the best strategy for them is to let it unwind naturally. Well, here we are, we're back up to here. So the question is how long would that take? Um, back in 2016, 17, based off of the maturities for those securities, it was looking at about seven to 10 years, right? So, you know, I would say at least that, if not a little bit more, especially given the Fed's policy of saying, we are gonna do what it takes to support this economy. So this expanded quantitative easing, likely here for some time. 
The other, um, thinking about interest rates, um, the Fed, the Federal Open Market Committee puts out their uh, projections, uh, started back in 2012, uh, various things, but the one I like to track and follow is, well, what's your view of longer term interest rates? And in the past, this was the old view, typically about 4%, 4 to 4.5% for the Fed funds rate was the way, that's, that's the long run interest rate that we should have for a vibrant economy, right? But over time, I don't need a statistical model to show you that the, the trend is down. And it's been consistently going down to a point now with the most recent numbers we're settling in it appears to be at about two and a half percent and on top of that the fed is out there saying this will stay low for the foreseeable future so looking at this going forward building into our own business plans thinking about how we work with producers how we manage our own financial institution these low interest rates are here for quite some that would be my opinion based off of looking at all the stuff and what folks are saying. Um, the other on, on interest rates and thinking about, you know, brought up about uh, the mortgage rates, uh, looking at, you know, how things are developing is to look at the yield curve. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, I, I said last year of talking about, look, a recession is maybe going to happen here fairly soon. It's before we know it potentially. Uh, is looking at that red line, which shows the yield curve uh, back in uh, September of 2019. And what that is, it shows an inverted yield curve where shorter term uh, rates are above longer term rates. Uh, and when I worked at the Fed, our bank president, Tom Honig, he said, this is the one measure that to follow of a leading indicator of a recession that really has some uh, uh, credence to it, some, you know, predictability to it, some reliability to it. It's not 100% perfect, but it does show a good way. And what it shows is market expectations about uh, what's going to happen, right? We need to build up that liquidity. We need to hold shorter term funds because there's some disruptions in the marketplace that are happening. And in 2019, that's what the market was sending signals to. There's some uncertainty with this, with where we are at, largely a lot of the debt that was out. Well, the Fed came in and then uh, began buying back mortgage-backed securities, and they got the lower end of the yield curve down, pushed it down. And then today, you see where the yield curve is at on shorter term rates. That's what happens to the short end of the yield curve when the Fed drops to the zero amount. They just push it down, right? So the question I have is this yield curve that we're looking at today, it would tell me that it's normal, but is it really normal? Or is it just a Fed-induced normal yield curve? Because all the things that have happened, like going back to 2019, those problems are still there. They haven't gone away. And what we've seen is the Fed has just, by targeting that they can control the low end of the yield curve, have pushed it down. Right? Now, at least from a market signal, it looks like it would be okay, but are there some underlying problems that potentially are occurring? Okay, so on inflation, um, you know, we've seen inflation kind of creep up a little bit, looking at the 10 year break even rate, uh, basically a market rate on where they feel inflation is going in 10 years. Uh, it went up off of the recession, but we are by no means above, you know, in very high territory. Um, so it sets at about one and a half percent. We also look at treasury uh, investment protected securities, or excuse me, treasury inflation protected securities or tips, tips rates have dropped into negative territory, right? So looking at that treasury yield relative to an inflation uh, index that it's connected to, we are actually in negative territory. So negative, what does that mean? Well, two things it's a signal of. Um, one that it's probably a bigger signal of is a flight to quality, right? Trying to protect principle. So much uncertainty out there in the marketplace we need to go to treasuries, right? That's one indication that would be, and I think that one is more than likely what the market is. The other it could be is fear of future inflation, that they're willing to pay to have the right to protect their principal, at least some of it. That's what it tells us. So those negative tips rates, you know, might be an indication of future inflation. 
But what are some of the, you know, I, I personally feel rapid future inflation, it, it would be a black swan type event for it to happen. Because I feel there are some significant headwinds leaning on what we would think about as, wow, that's really bad inflation. Like thinking back to like the 70s, right? Um, you know, first it's just, there's just really no core inflation right now. Real wages have been very flat, maybe have crept up slightly, but we just don't have a lot of uh, wage growth that typically goes with a lot of future inflation. So it goes to concerns within the labor market. Uh, globalization. We are a connected country. Our central bank is connected. The US dollar is so connected in so many different ways that that also is a headwind to inflation. Uh, you know, the economy is struggling. Uh, we have a market that has very well anchored inflation expectations. This 10 year rate being right around one and a half percent with all this government debt that's out there and the central bank buying treasuries, and we're still at one and a half percent. Market expectations are very well anchored. Um, and then, you know, I, I just, you know, looking at what the Fed and market is saying, uh, it's just it's such a low probability, like a black swan type. So what could make that potentially happen? Um, there are some signals, you know, we have the very high public debt with the US government. You know, we have seen some prices of goods and services rise, but are they more transitory? Things that'll be worked out through the pandemic, maybe not going to stay. Uh, I do feel that if we move away from globalization and we have more protectionist trade policies in place, that could lead to it. Uh, that could really push up uh, inflation. And then, of course, the negative tips rates that we saw before. So those would be potentially the things that could push us into a very high inflation environment. So uh, my, I got four kind of uh, takeaways here for lenders, producers, and businesses of thinking about the macro, um, macroeconomic update. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, a lot, right? And so when we are in an uncertain environment, what does that tell me? What, what do I, how do I think? Well, building liquidity is extremely important. We need to find ways to build up that liquidity. Uh, reasonably manage costs. We can't just cut everything to a point we can no longer operate as a business. And we still have to function, but we need to manage our costs. Be mindful about that. And then when we go out, look at growth opportunities, we need to scrutinize it. Maybe apply a bit more of a discount factor on that capital investment that you're looking at. Because there is a fair amount of uncertainty as well. The other, uh, with government subsidies that are flowing through, um, how are producers going to use it? What are they going to do with this tremendous amount of money flowing into them, right? If they're building their business plan, or any business, is building a business plan of continuing to receive these government payments, that is a very poor business plan, very bad, because you have a change in administration, you have a change in any sort of trade policies, that could all go away very quickly. And so if you're growing and taking advantage of opportunities, thinking that we're gonna continue to get these subsidies, that, that's a quick way to get yourself in trouble. Maybe instead use it to build liquidity, right? To get you through this uncertain time. Um, low interest rates, you know, lending margins, look at net interest margin, continue to be low, that's very difficult for lenders in this room, bankers, right? Tight net interest margin is a very difficult way to operate, right? But it's likely here. So how do we continue to work in that environment? Now, I wish, wish I had the silver bullet for you, but I don't. Like point to it and say something you need to manage and focus on, uh, and you gotta find a way to, to work through. And then lastly, um, you know, is it a time to refinance restructure debt? And I, I would say yes. Uh, but what's the plan? What are you going to do? If we're just turning out losses and we're not going to change anything with how we run our operation, then that's a bad plan. If you're gonna do something different and restructure, how, what are you going to do to change? How are you going to alter and be you know, able to thrive in this environment or at least survive, do something different than what you've done? Okay, so with that, Hopefully, left some time here for questions. I do. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'm certainly. Cool. 
You put him to sleep. He dimmed the lights. <laughs> So what are you all seeing um, with your lend with your borrowers? Restructuring? Refinancing lower rates? What are you all seeing? Nothing? And we are out of practice with our live events. Man, it's a good thing Michael Taylor's on the program. She'll get you guys going. Right, Michael? So we have a lot of producers out there just taking a wait and see approach what you're seeing. Yeah. So restructuring on the, the interest rate and the finance cost. Is that generally what everybody is seeing? Kind of wait and see in certain times, build, well, really effectively taking that money, build up liquidity. Which is a good thing. Cash. What's that? Hoarding cash. Hoarding cash. Yep. Just sit and wait and see. It's good to hear. Got one here, Brian. What change should be on the table for a new plan? Examples. What change should be on for a new I think for your last point there? Oh. Oh, have a plan. What should be? Oh, well. Um, if it is a situation where um, maybe it's a particular part of the business, I mean, every situation is unique, but in general, uh, if there's a part of the business that has just been a drag on the operation, it continues to be a drag, but it is, let's call it a sacred cow, and you're continuing to finance it from other operations to a point that it has turned into some losses that say set in your operating note, um, if you decide to turn those out, what are you going to do with that part of the business that is not functioning well? Are we going to completely get rid of it? And then if we, or do we want to finance and term it out? Or do we maybe want to sell land in order to rectify that situation? But if we sell land, are we going to have a relationship with the landlord in order to maintain that income coming off of it? So there's a lot of different things, but what I would first focus on is what is the part of the business, the operation that is not functioning well, and then consider changing from that, right? If you restructure, if you refinance, if you go get rid of that, how are you going to change that part of the business? And I understand for lenders that's difficult because of lender liability. Um, I do think there are services out there that you could point them to. I know K-State, we have some of that. I know Kevin Herbel's here with the Kansas Farm Management Association can have an ag economist walk through some of those discussions. But I understand the sensitivity for a lender to be going in and telling them how to run their operation. But the first thing that I would want to look at is what is the part of the business that isn't working? One more, I think, on the line. See, everybody's used to Zoom. They're all asking the questions <laughs> on Zoom. If the Democrats control government after elections, how might that change government support for ag? <laughs> oh, the political question. <laughs> how, how much do I wade off into this? Um, well, policy and under the different regimes, Republican and Democrat, um, not really my uh, area of expertise and so our actually our next presenter jenny ift is our new policy economist so i'm going to take something from what jenny and i were uh discussing in uh the car uh, on the way down uh the question would be will these ad hoc programs continue or will we look more to you know with democrats where they move more to is 
conservation programs. Could that happen? Possibly. It's that one looking into that crystal ball, boy, I do not feel very comfortable with. Uh, but it, I would be wondering about a lot of these ad hoc programs and then do we focus more on conservation? And I got to take, I got to give a lot of credit to Jenny for, for having that discussion on the way down. So thank you for that question. I don't want to steal Jenny's thunder, but she's our new, our new uh, extension economist sitting in the department. So. I think with that, we're going to go ahead and stop and give her a chance to take it from there. So thanks, Brian. Thank, thank you. you.